Chapters 34 through 43 of Confessions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Confessions of St. Augustine. Translated by Albert C. Outler. Book 10, Chapters 34 through 43. Chapter 34. There remain the delights of these eyes of my flesh, about which I must make my confession in the hearing of the ears of thy temple, brotherly and pious ears. Thus I will finish the list of the temptations of carnal appetite which still assail me, groaning and desiring as I am to be clothed upon with my house from heaven. The eyes delight in fair and varied forms, and bright and pleasing colors. Let these not take possession of my soul. Rather let God possess it, he who didst make all things very good indeed, he is still my good, and not these. The pleasures of sight affect me all the time I am awake. There is no rest from them given me, as there is from the voices of melody, which I can occasionally find in silence. For daylight, that queen of the colors, floods all that we look upon everywhere I go during the day. It flits about me in manifold forms, and soothes me even when I am busy about other things, not noticing it. And it presents itself so forcibly that if it is suddenly withdrawn, it is looked for with longing, and if it is long absent, the mind is saddened. O oh, light, which Tobit saw even with his eyes closed in blindness, when he taught his son the way of life, and went before him himself in the steps of love, and never went astray. Or that light which Isaac saw when his fleshly eyes were dim, so that he could not see, because of old age, and it was permitted him unknowingly to bless his sons, but in the blessing of them to know them. Or that light which Jacob saw, when he too, blind in old age, yet with an enlightened heart, threw light on the nation of men yet to come, pre-signified in the persons of his own sons, and laid his hands mystically crossed upon his grandchildren by Joseph, not as their father, who saw them from without, but as though he were within them, and distinguished them aright, this is the true light, it is one, and all are one who see and love it. But that corporal light of which I was speaking, seasons the life of the world for her blind lovers with a tempting and fatal sweetness. Those who know how to praise thee for it, O God, creator of us all, take it up in thy hymn, and are not taken over by it in their sleep. Such a man I desire to be. I resist the seductions of my eyes, lest my feet be entangled as I go forward in thy way, and I raise my invisible eyes to thee, that thou wouldest be pleased to pluck my feet out of the net. Thou dost continually pluck them out, for they are easily ensnared. Thou ceasest not to pluck them out, but I constantly remain fast in the snares set all around me. However, thou who keepest Israel shall never slumber or sleep. What numberless things there are, products of the various arts and manufactures in our clothes, shoes, vessels, and all such things, besides such things as pictures and statuary, and all these far beyond the necessary and moderate use of them or their significance for the life of piety, which men have added for the delight of the eye, copying the outward forms of the things they make, but inwardly forsaking him by whom they were made, and destroying what they themselves have been made to be. And I, O oh my God, and my joy, I also raise a hymn to thee for all these things, and offer a sacrifice of praise to my sanctifier, because those beautiful forms which pass through the medium of the human soul into the artist's hands come from that beauty which is above our minds, which my soul sighs for day and night. But the craftsmen and devotees of these outward beauties discover the norm by which they judge them from that higher beauty, but not the measure of their use. Still, even if they do not see it, it is there nevertheless, to guard them from wandering astray, and to keep their strength for thee, and not dissipate it in delights that pass into boredom. And for myself, though I can see and understand this, I am still entangled in my own course with such beauty, but thou wilt rescue me, O Lord, thou wilt rescue me, for thy loving kindness is before my eyes. For I am captivated in my weakness, but thou in thy mercy dost rescue me, sometimes without my knowing it, because I had only lightly fallen. At other times, the rescue is painful because I was stuck fast. 
Chapter 35 Besides this, there is yet another form of temptation, still more complex in its peril. For in addition to the fleshly appetite which strives for the gratification of all senses and pleasures, in which its slaves perish because they separate themselves from thee, there is also a certain vain and curious longing in the soul, rooted in the same bodily senses, which is cloaked under the name of knowledge and learning, not having pleasure in the flesh, but striving for new experiences through the flesh. This longing, since its origin is our appetite for learning, and since the sight is the chief of our senses in the acquisition of knowledge, is called in the divine language the lust of the eyes. For seeing is a function of the eyes, yet we also use this word for the other senses as well, when we exercise them in the search for knowledge. We do not say, listen how it glows, smell how it glistens, taste how it shines, or feel how it flashes, since all of these are said to be seen. And we do not simply say, see how it shines, which only the eyes can perceive, but we also say, see how it sounds, see how it smells, see how it tastes, see how hard it is. Thus, as we said before, the whole round of sensory experience is called the lust of the eyes, because the function of seeing, in which the eyes have the principal role, is applied by analogy to the other senses when they are seeking after any kind of knowledge. From this, then, one can the more clearly distinguish whether it is pleasure or curiosity that is being pursued by the senses. For pleasure pursues objects that are beautiful, melodious, fragrant, savory, soft. But curiosity, seeking new experiences, will even seek out the contrary of these, not with the purpose of experiencing the discomfort that often accompanies them, but out of a passion for experimenting and knowledge. For what pleasure is there in the sight of a lacerated corpse, which makes you shudder? And yet if there is one lying close by, we flock to it, as if to be made sad and pale. People fear lest they should see such a thing even in sleep, just as they would if, when awake, someone compelled them to go and see it, or if some rumor of its beauty had attracted them. This is also the case with the other senses. It would be tedious to pursue a complete analysis of it. This malady of curiosity is the reason for all those strange sights exhibited in the theater. It is also the reason why we proceed to search out the secret powers of nature, those which have nothing to do with our destiny, which do not profit us to know about, and concerning which men desire to know only for the sake of knowing. And it is with this same motive of perverted curiosity for knowledge that we consult the magical arts. Even in religion itself, this prompting drives us to make trial of God when signs and wonders are eagerly asked of Him, not desired for any saving end, but only to make trial of Him. In such a wilderness so vast, crammed with snares and dangers, behold how many of them I have lopped off and cast from my heart, as Thou, O God of my salvation, hast enabled me to do. And yet, when would I dare to say, since so many things of this sort still buzz around our daily lives, when would I dare to say that no such motive prompts my seeing or creates a vain curiosity in me? It is true that now the theaters never attract me, nor do I now care to inquire about the courses of the stars, and my soul has never sought answers from the departed spirits. All sacrilegious oaths I abhor. And yet, O Lord my God, to whom I owe all humble and single-hearted service, with what subtle suggestion the enemy still influences me to require some sign from thee? But by our king, and by Jerusalem, our pure and chaste homeland, I beseech thee that where any consenting to such thoughts is now far from me, so may it always be farther and farther. And when I entreat thee for the salvation of any man, the end I aim at is something more than the entreating. Let it be that as thou dost what thou wilt, thou dost also give me the grace willing to follow thy lead. Now really, in how many of the most minute and trivial things my curiosity is still daily tempted, and who can keep the tally on how often I succumb? How often, when people are telling idle tales, we begin by tolerating them lest we should give offense to the sensitive, and then gradually we come to listen willingly. I do not nowadays go to the circus to see a dog chase a rabbit, but if by chance I pass such a race in the fields, it quite easily distracts me even from some serious thought and draws me after it, not that I turn aside from my horse, but with the inclination of my mind. And unless, by showing me my weakness, 
thou dost speedily warn me to rise above such a sight to thee by a deliberate act of thought or else to despise the whole thing and pass it by then i become absorbed in the sight vain creature that i am how is it that when i am sitting at home a lizard catching flies or a spider entangling them as they fly into her webs oftentimes arrests me is the feeling of curiosity not the same just because these are such tiny creatures from them i proceed to praise thee the wonderful creator and disposer of all things but it is not this that first attracts my attention it is one thing to get up quickly and another thing not to fall and of both such things my life is full and my only hope is in thy exceeding great mercy for when this heart of ours is made the depot of such things and is overrun by the throng of these abounding vanities then our prayers are often interrupted and disturbed by them even while we are in thy presence and direct the voice of our hearts to thy ears such a great business as this is is broken off by the inroads of i know not what idle thoughts chapter thirty six shall we then also reckon this vain curiosity among the things that are to be but lightly esteemed shall anything restore us to hope except thy complete mercy since thou hast begun to change us thou knowest to what extent thou hast already changed me for first of all thou didst heal me of the lust for vindicating myself so that thou mightest then forgive all my remaining iniquities and heal all my diseases and redeem my life from corruption and crown me with loving kindness and tender mercies and satisfy my desires with good things it was thou who didst restrain my pride with thy fear and bowed my neck with thy yoke and now i bear the yoke and it is light to me because thou didst promise it to be so and hast made it to be so and so in truth it was though i knew it not when i feared to take it up but o lord thou who alone reignest without pride because thou alone art the true lord who hast no lord has this third kind of temptation left me or can it leave me during this life the desire to be feared and loved of men with no other view than that i may find in it a joy that is no joy it is rather a wretched life and an unseemly ostentation it is a special reason why we do not love thee nor devotedly fear thee therefore thou resistest the proud but givest grace to the humble thou thunderest down on the ambitious designs of the world and the foundations of the hills tremble and yet certain offices in human society require the office-holder to be loved and feared of men and through this the adversary of our true blessedness presses hard upon us scattering everywhere his snares of well done well done so that while we are eagerly picking them up we may be caught unawares and split off our joy from thy truth and fix it on the deceits of men in this way we come to take pleasure in being loved and feared not for thy sake but in thy stead by such means as this the adversary makes men like myself that he may have them as his own not in the harmony of love but in the fellowship of punishment the one who aspired to exalt his throne in the north that in the darkness and the cold men might have to serve him mimicking thee in perverse and distorted ways but see o lord we are thy little flock possess us stretch thy wings above us and let us take refuge under them be thou our glory let us be loved for thy sake and let thy word be feared in us those who desire to be commended by men whom thou condemnest will not be defended by men when thou judgest nor will they be delivered when thou dost condemn them but when not as a sinner is praised in the wicked desires of his soul nor when the unrighteous man is blessed in his unrighteousness a man is praised for some gift that thou hast given him and he is more gratified at the praise for himself than because he possesses the gift for which he is praised such a one is praised while thou dost condemn him in such a case the one who praised is truly better than the one who was praised for the gift of god in man was pleasing to the one while the other was better pleased with the gift of man than with the gift of god chapter thirty seven by these temptations we are daily tried o lord we are tried unceasingly our daily furnace is the human tongue and also in this respect thou commandest us to be continent give what thou commandest and command what thou wilt in this matter thou knowest the groans of my heart and the rivers of my eyes for i am not able to know for certain how far i am clean of this plague and i stand in great fear of my secret faults which thy eyes perceive though mine do not 
for in respect of the pleasures of my flesh and of idle curiosity i see how far i have been able to hold my mind in check when i abstain from them either by voluntary act of will or because they simply are not at hand for then i can inquire of myself how much more or less frustrating it is to me not to have them this is also true about riches which are sought for in order that they may minister to one of these three lusts or two or the whole complex of them the mind is able to see clearly if when it has them it despises them so they may be cast aside and it may prove itself but if we desire to test our power of doing without praise must we then live wickedly or lead a life so atrocious and abandoned that every one who knows us will detest us what greater madness than this can either be said or conceived and yet if praise both by custom and right is the companion of a good life and of good works we should as little forego its companionship as the good life itself but unless a thing is absent i do not know whether i should be contented or troubled at having to do without it what is it then that i am confessing to thee o lord concerning this sort of temptation what else than that i am delighted with praise but more with the truth itself than with praise for if i were to have any choice whether if i were mad or utterly in the wrong i would prefer to be praised by all men or if i were steadily and fully confident in the truth would prefer to be blamed by all i see which i should choose yet i wish i were unwilling that the approval of others should add anything to my joy for any good i have yet i admit that it does increase it and more than that dispraise diminishes it then when i am disturbed over this wretchedness of mine an excuse presents itself to me the value of which thou knowest o god for it renders me uncertain for since it is not only continence that thou hast enjoined on us that is what things to hold back our love from but righteousness as well that is what to bestow our love upon and hast wished us to love not only thee but also our neighbour it often turns out that when i am gratified by intelligent praise i seem to myself to be gratified by the competence or insight of my neighbour or on the other hand i am sorry for the defect in him when i hear him dispraise either what he does not understand or what is good for i am sometimes grieved at the praise i get either when those things that displease me in myself are praised in me or when lesser and trifling goods are valued more highly than they should be but again how do i know whether i feel this way because i am unwilling that he who praises me should differ from me concerning myself not because i am moved with any consideration for him but because the good things that please me in myself are more pleasing to me when they also please another for in a way i am not praised when my judgment of myself is not praised since either those things which are displeasing to me are praised or those things which are less pleasing to me are more praised am i not then quite uncertain of myself in this respect behold o truth it is in thee that i see that i ought not to be moved by my own praises for my own sake but for the sake of my neighbor's good and whether this is actually my way i truly do not know on this score i know less of myself than thou dost i beseech thee now o my god to reveal myself to me also that i may confess to my brethren who are to pray for me in those matters where i find myself weak let me once again examine myself the more diligently if in my own praise i am moved with concern for my neighbor why am i less moved if some other man is unjustly dispraised than when it happens to me why am i more irritated at that reproach which is cast on me than at one which is with equal injustice cast upon another in my presence am i ignorant of this also or is it true that i am deceiving myself and do not keep the truth before thee in my heart and tongue put such madness far from me o lord lest my mouth be to me the oil of sinners to anoint my head chapter thirty eight i am needy and poor still i am better when in secret groanings i displease myself and seek thy mercy until what is lacking in me is renewed and made complete for that peace which the eye of the proud does not know the reports that come from the mouth and from actions known to men have in them a most perilous temptation to the love of praise this love builds up a certain complacency in one's own excellency and then goes around collecting solicited compliments it tempts me even when i inwardly reprove myself for it and this precisely because it is reproved 
for a man may often glory vainly in the very scorn of vainglory and in this case it is not any longer the scorn of vainglory in which he glories for he does not truly despise it when he inwardly glories it chapter thirty nine within us there is yet another evil arising from the same sort of temptation by it they become empty who please themselves in themselves although they do not please or displease or aim at pleasing others but in pleasing themselves they displease thee very much not merely taking pleasure in things that are not good as if they were good but taking pleasure in thy good things as if they were their own or even as if they were thine but still as if they had received them through their own merit or even as if they had them through thy grace still without this grace with their friends but as if they envied that grace to others in all these and similar perils and labors thou perceivest the agitation of my heart and i would rather feel my wounds being cured by thee than not inflicted by me on myself chapter forty where hast thou not accompanied me o truth teaching me both what to avoid and what to desire when i have submitted to thee what i could understand about matters here below and have sought thy counsel about them with my external senses i have viewed the world as i was able and have noticed the life which my body derives from me and from these senses of mine from that stage i advanced inwardly into the recesses of my memory the manifold chambers of my mind marvelously full of unmeasured wealth and i reflected on this and was afraid and could understand none of these things without thee and found thee to be none of them nor did i myself discover these things i who went over them all and labored to distinguish and to value everything according to its dignity excepting some things upon the report of my senses and questioning about others which i thought to be related to my inner self distinguishing and numbering the reporters themselves and in that vast storehouse of my memory investigating some things depositing other things taking out still others neither was i myself when i did this that is that ability of mind by which i did it nor was it thou for thou art that never failing light from which i took counsel about all them whether they were what they were and what was their real value in all this i heard thee teaching and commanding me and this i often do and this is a delight to me and as far as i can get relief from my necessary duties i resort to this kind of pleasure but in all these things which i review when i consult thee i still do not find a secure place for my soul save in thee in whom my scattered members may be gathered together and nothing of me escape from thee and sometimes thou introducest me to a most rare and inward feeling an inexplicable sweetness if this were to come to perfection in me i do not know to what point life might not then arrive but still by these wretched weights of mine i relapse into these common things and am sucked in by my old customs and am held i sorrow much yet i am still closely held to this extent then the burden of habit presses us down i can exist in this fashion but i do not wish to do so in that other way i wish i were but cannot be in both ways i am wretched chapter forty one and now i have thus considered the infirmities of my sins under the headings of the three major lusts and i have called thy right hand to my aid for with a wounded heart i have seen thy brightness and having been beaten back i cried who can attain to it i am cut off from before thy eyes thou art the truth who presidest over all things but i because of my greed did not wish to lose thee but still along with thee i wish also to possess a lie just as no one wishes to lie in such a way as to be ignorant of what is true by this i lost thee for thou wilt not condescend to be enjoyed along with a lie chapter forty two whom could i find to reconcile me to thee should i have approached the angels what kind of prayer what kind of rites many who were striving to return to thee and were not able of themselves have i am told tried this and have fallen into a longing for curious visions and deserved to be deceived being exalted they sought thee in their pride of learning and they thrust themselves forward rather than beating their breasts and so by a likeness of heart they drew to themselves the princes of the air their conspirators and companions in pride by whom they were deceived by the power of magic thus they sought a mediator by whom they might be cleansed but there was none 
for the mediator they sought was the devil, disguising himself as an angel of light. And he allured their proud flesh the more because he had no fleshly body. They were mortal and sinful, but thou, O Lord, to whom they arrogantly sought to be reconciled, art immortal and sinless. But a mediator between God and man ought to have something in him like God and something in him like man, lest in being like man he should be far from God, or if only like God, he should be far from man, and so should not be a mediator. That deceitful mediator, then, by whom, by thy secret judgment, human pride deserves to be deceived, had one thing in common with man, that is, his sin. In another respect, he would seem to have something in common with God, for not being clothed with the mortality of the flesh, he could boast that he was immortal. But since the wages of sin is death, what he really has in common with men is that, together with them, he is condemned to death. Chapter 43 But the true mediator, whom thou in thy secret mercy hast revealed to the humble, and hast sent to them, so that through his example they also might learn the same humility, that mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, appeared between mortal sinners and the immortal just one. He was mortal as men are mortal, he was righteous as God is righteous, and because the reward of his righteousness is life and peace, he could, through his righteousness united with God, cancel the death of justified sinners, which he was willing to have in common with them. Hence he was manifested to holy men of old, to the end that they might be saved through faith in his passion to come, even as we through faith in his passion which is past. As man he was mediator, but as the word he was not something in between the two, because he was equal to God, and God with God, and with the Holy Spirit, one God. How hast thou loved us, O good Father, who dost not spare thy only Son, but didst deliver him up for us wicked ones? How hast thou loved us, for whom he did not count it robbery to be equal with thee, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? He alone was free among the dead. He alone had power to lay down his life and power to take it up again. And for us he became to thee both victor and victim, and victor because he was the victim. For us he was to thee both priest and sacrifice, and priest because he was the sacrifice. Out of slaves he maketh us thy sons, because he was born of thee and did serve us. Rightly then is my hope fixed strongly on him, that thou wilt heal all my diseases through him, who sitteth at thy right hand, and maketh intercession for us. Otherwise I should utterly despair, for my infirmities are many and great, indeed they are very many and very great, but thy medicine is still greater. Otherwise we might think that thy word was removed from union with man, and despair of ourselves, if it had not been that he was made flesh and dwelt among us. Terrified by my sins and the load of my misery, I had resolved in my heart and considered flight into the wilderness. But thou didst forbid me, and thou didst strengthen me, saying that since Christ died for all, they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. Behold, O Lord, I cast all my care on thee, that I may live and behold wondrous things out of thy law. Thou knowest my incompetence and my infirmities, Teach me, and heal me. Thy only Son, he in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, hath redeemed me with his blood. Let not the proud speak evil of me, because I keep my ransom before my mind, and eat and drink and share my food and drink. For, being poor, I desire to be satisfied from him, together with those who eat and are satisfied, and they shall praise the Lord that seek him. End of Book 10, Chapters 34 through 43.